Good morning. It's uh, I, we are blessed to be able to come and uh, see you all before the end of the year, and so I must thank uh, Elder Eldon and <coughs> Pastor John for this privilege. Eh? Okay, uh, earlier on when I was hearing uh, Elder Eldon mention about heaven, uh, and uh, I was just reminded of this old friend of mine who, who loved country and western, and his favorite song was this, Everybody wants to go to heaven, nobody wants to die. And, uh, but, you know, recently I, I began to realize something, you know, that actually there's a very sad group of people uh, who can't wait to die. And uh, I, I recently met people who are struggling with cancer as they age, you know, and they, they're really asking God, when are you going to take me home? And recently I met a friend who has bipolar and, uh, you know, as you reach your 70s, the downswing becomes so painful that she's actually wishing. She, she messaged me the other day to say, you know, suddenly I, I'm beginning to feel uh, as if I'm yearning to go and be with the Lord. And, and when I saw that, I, I, I was really touched to realize, you know, that actually there are people who, who really want to go and be with the Lord. And... We ask ourselves, how real is heaven to us? To those people, there's a real longing, you know. But for us, uh, life is pretty good on earth. Uh. So, so actually, many, many times, uh, I'm really not in a hurry to go to heaven. Uh. Huh? Uh, because life is pretty good, except when you go through some difficult time, you know. Then you're waiting to go to heaven. So th this is something that I, I just thought, I, I realized, hey, this is something I, I must... Uh, continue to be aware of, you know, that uh, I, I must really live with the end in mind, wanting to be with the Lord. Okay, uh, that, that projector side is not working, or okay, so I'll, uh, you, you don't mind if I slant a little bit so I know where I am. Huh? Okay, L let me just start off with this. Huh? Uh, a few weeks ago, huh, I had the joy of having dinner with uh, two old friends. And these people, I knew them in the 80s uh, when they were in the program of the hiding place. But you know, 40 years later, we had a reunion because the, the guy in the middle is now working in uh, Thailand. He's doing work among uh, AIDS victims and other things. You know, so thank God that he's been uh, able to serve the Lord uh, and ex drug addict uh, now doing education to touch lives. And as we talked together, we were reminiscing, you know, like, uh, wow, 40 years have passed since we met each other, you know. What keeps us going? And, you know, there are some people who say, hey, they are here because they went through this great program that saw them through. And there was a part played by this, you know. And of course, they say, oh yeah, maybe they went to this great church that sustained them, you know. But at the end of the day, uh, I think we all came to this conclusion, you know, that what kept us going uh, was the grace of God, you know. The grace of God that continue to work in our lives uh, despite all our failures. And another thing that kept us going was the community of God. Because you see, these people, you know, when... They have been rejected by society. They went through so much difficult times, you know. And it is a community that was willing to accept them, to give them a second chance that made it possible for them to go on. So actually, all of you here play such an important part, you know, because you are part of a community that actually can embrace and give people another chance to move on in life. So as we approach end of uh, 2024, and, and I'm glad that I was able to see you all just before the year ends, uh, I asked myself, what would be my wish for all of you in RCC? And uh, I, I'm not into that prophetic kind of thing where I'm going to tell you, thus saith the Lord for RCC. But I, I want to tell you what would be my heart's wish for you in 2025. And for each of you, this would be my heart's desire, you know. 
Firstly, to continue to run the race. See, Paul was reaching the end and he says, I have finished, I've run the race, you know. But for many of us, uh, we may have many good years to go. So I want to encourage you, continue to run the race. Many people have dropped off halfway. Very sadly, many people drop off just before the finishing point. And then continue to fight the good fight. Because many people reach a point where they just stop fighting for what is right and be willing to compromise and just drift on. And thirdly, continue to look forward to the return of Jesus and continue to look forward to the crown that he has for you, to live with the end in mind. And today as we meditate on the word, I, I want to pray that the account in the Bible of a king named Jotham will challenge you to work towards this goal. Because he's a king who's interestingly, his life huh, was only covered in nine verses in the Bible. You know? But as I read these verses, and the Lord just spoke to me so much about him. So I, I want us to look at this passage. Now, but before we begin, we just want to look at his father. And what happened to his father was this. King Uzziah had leprosy until the day he died. He lived in a separate house, leprous and banned from the temple of the Lord. Jotham, his son, had charge of the palace and governed the people of the land. Jotham was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. His mother's name was Jerusha, daughter of Zadok. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father, just as his father um, Uzziah had done, but unlike him, he did not enter the temple of the Lord. The people, however, continued their corrupt practices. There's a king who wanted to serve the Lord, but the people continued their corrupt practices. Jotham rebuilt the upper gate of the temple of the Lord and did extensive work on the wall at the hill of Ophel. He built towns in the country of Judah and forts and towers in the wooded areas. Jotham waged wars against the kings of the Ammonites and conquered them. That year, the Ammonites paid him a hundred talents of silver, 10,000 cores of wheat and 10,000 cores of barley. The Ammonites brought him the same amount also in the second and third years. Jotham grew powerful because he walked steadfastly with the Lord his God. The other events in Jotham's reign, including all his wars and the other things he did, are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. He was 25 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Jotham rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David and Ahaz his son succeeded him as king. Before we go to the background, let's just commit this time to the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, that we can have this privilege of meditating on your word. And we pray that it is your word that would speak to us as your Holy Spirit enlightens us, Lord. And we want to see, oh Lord, what you have to say for us today. So we want to commit ourselves to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jotham was the son of of Uzziah, and the grandson of this king called Amaziah. Amaziah was an interesting king because he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but he didn't do it wholeheartedly. And a lot of people live that way. They want to live for God, but they don't live it wholeheartedly. And then later, he turned to idolatry, and this king was murdered. So this is the kind of grandfather he had. you know. Then his father Uzziah started well. But later he became proud. He was not contented to be a king. He wanted to be a priest as well. So he went into the temple to offer sacrifices. And the priest tried to stop him, saying, no, just stick to what you are called to do. And instead he insisted on offering sacrifices. And God struck him with leprosy. And the leprosy was so bad that he had to leave the temple. He was so eager to leave the temple and the priest ushered him out of the temple before he defiled the place. So, 
because he was leprous, he couldn't hold court and run the country. So his son became the regent, running the country while the father still was alive. Then eventually when the father died, Jotham took over. At the age of 25, he took over and he reigned as king until his death. But as you see, at that time, idolatry had already begun to creep in. From the grandfather's time, the grandfather opened the door, the father tried to put things in place, but then the father ended badly also. And so, slowly, idolatry began to come in. And in the time of Jotham, he tried to be sincere, he tried to want to serve the Lord. But there were people who still continue to work with hearts that were full of idolatry. So there are three things I want us to look at today as we meditate on his life. First is the common ground. Second, choices made. And three, a consistent walk. So we begin with common ground. And the scripture passage that I would like us to look at is this. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. So you may begin by asking me, you know, hey, this guy was a king, you know. He had everything going for him, you know. If he had a problem, he had all the people at his feet to serve him. If he had a sickness, he had the best doctors available. He had no lack of money. He never worried about paying bills. So how could I relate to him and say, I want to live for God the way he did? But then you realize when you look at him uh, that he was a guy with problems as well. You know. He came from a family uh, with a lot of hang-ups. His grandfather was murdered because he turned to idolatry. His father became so bad so proud that his father, in the end, ended up with leprosy. So can you imagine, uh, you take over as king. Uh, you're always very conscious, you know. Uh, have you met people uh, who they introduced you, you know. Hey, this guy is Brother Mark's son. Uh, and then straight away, everybody be thinking, oh yeah, Mark, uh, this one, that one. So of course, Brother Mark, you'll have a lot of pleasant things to say. Eh? Sister Catherine also, you say how nice they are. My son will always say, Sister Catherine was his Sunday school teacher. So he had a lot of pleasant things to think about, you know. Ah, but there are some people, eh, the moment they look at this guy, eh, they say, you know this guy, his father went to jail, you know. So immediately you stop looking at the guy already, you know. You're thinking, this is the son of a prisoner, you know. Then, you know, this guy, uh, his mother, uh, she's the one gambled, you know. Always go to gambling den and play. All the money went off. That's why the father had to go to prison because he CBT some money from the company. Wow. So immediately after that, you stop looking at the guy, right? And so I tell you, people, a lot of people go through uh, stigma in life because of their family. And this guy, he, you know, he became king. He was always very conscious, you know, of the father. While he was leading as king, I'm king because my father is a leper now. So I had to take over earlier. So he had all these stigmas and you and I could be having stigmas like that, you know. And then he had members in his kingdom who were not committed. But we had the same faithful God as him. And if you look around at ourselves, you also realize, you know, that actually all of us have checkered backgrounds. Interesting things about our family members, interesting things about our ancestors. And then you go into a church, sometimes you see the pastor, every time he looks at the people and he smiles at them uh, in his heart. I, it won't happen in RCC, uh, but elsewhere, uh, you see the, the pastor in his heart is grieving, you know. He said, People are putting on a show, but I know all their hearts. I know their private lives. And so you can see there will be pastors like him, you know, grieving. Because he said, I want to serve God. I want this church to grow. I want this church to be on fire. And then you look at them and then they say, but none of these people are on fire. In fact, a lot of these people are putting out the fire. And so you have pastors like that. 
And then there are some people, the people are on fire, they want to move on, you know. But the pastor uh, is moving on second gear only, you know. Because he's, he, he just, you know, in the army they say, you know. He's just dragging his feet, happy to go on, you know. And I've met leaders like that also, you know, who, who are just very happy to move on, even the people are on fire. So all of us can be going through these kind of situations, you know. And all of us could be facing our challenges. When people look at you, what is it about you that they look at? Do they see you as somebody who is reaching the end of your usefulness? Uh, that's a sad thing, you know. When people look at old people, they say these people are reaching the end of their usefulness. And then when they see young people, they say, what is there useful about them? So, so you, you have all these kind of struggles going on, you know, and people wonder in between, uh, where do I fit in, you know? And then there are some people who are housewives, and then they say, what can I accomplish as a housewife? Yeah, well, at least you can bring up godly children uh, to succeed your family, you know. Because there are a lot of people uh, who have been so busy with their careers, they never invested in their family and children. And in their old age, they're sitting down grieving and crying and saying, if only my children come and visit me. If only my children will come to church at least once a year for Christmas or what. But then... They probably only think that the only time my children will come to church is for my funeral service, which is very sad, you know. So all of us actually have some things in common with him. Even though he may be a king, he had all these hang-ups, he had all these struggles, you know. But the thing was, he had the same God as us, which moves us to the next point, which is this. He made choices. And friends, Choices are the things that often determine what will make a difference in our lives. So uh, the, the scripture here in Joshua, which you all are familiar with, it says, uh, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is, eager, it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. See, Joshua knew, you know, at the end of his days, uh, despite all the leadership he has given, despite the miracles people have seen, uh, the hearts of the Israelites were always hard. And the history of the Israelites always showed that. But then Joshua said, you choose whom you serve, and you answer for the decisions you make. But as for me and my house, I have made a decision. And my choice is that I will serve the Lord. And so I want to ask you, you know, is your life a life in which decisions are made? That you are deciding? Are you driven? Or are you drifting? Not everybody in this world today wants to make decisions, you know. Some people make decisions because they are driven. And some people are driven by something inside or people driven by something outside. Do you meet people like that? People who live lives because they are driven by something inside. I tell you, I work for bosses uh, who are driven, you know. Driven by ambition. Driven by the need for recognition. Driven by the need for people to give them praise and glory. There are bosses... Don't ever cross them. If you disagree with him, shut your mouth and after the meeting, go and tell him. You embarrass him at the meeting and your career is finished. There are people who are driven, so driven that they can become so difficult. In this world, there are a lot of people like that, you know, driven. They make decisions because they are driven. Sometimes they make unreasonable decisions. Sometimes they make unreasonable demands on people. And we could be making choices because we are driven. Some people are driven by things inside of them. There are some people who need to prove themselves because they have failed. There are people who grow up where the father always says, you will never amount to anything. You are useless. You are stupid. So what happens? He spends his whole life wanting to prove to the world that he's useful. And you know, very sad huh, that some of these people are pastors and leaders in the Christian community. And so you see them in their churches. Uh, they are driven people, you know. They're trying to drive the church 
to accomplish something so they can prove to somebody that this guy was not the useless fellow that his parents said he was. Not just males, you know, ladies as well. Sometimes ladies grow up with a father telling them, why are you so useless? Why are you not like your brother? I have friends who come and tell me, no matter how hard I study, eh, no matter how good my grades are, somehow my mother will always say that my brother is better than me. And so they grew up having to prove that they are good. So there are people who are driven. And there are people who are driven by external forces. Some people decide that a promotion is coming up. They are driven by it. Some people decide that they need to make decisions or because of what people think of them. And especially in leadership, uh, you have a big problem, you know. Are you willing to make decisions uh, that are unpopular, that are unpleasant? Because it has to be made. And I, many, many times you make decisions uh, that people in the church cannot appreciate immediately. In years to come, they will look back and appreciate and say, wow, yeah, actually good. No, but they'll never admit that at that time, uh, they say, you are an idiot who made stupid decisions. Many, many times in leadership, you will face this. So you can be driven by external factors. And some people, because of fear of others, they cringe from making wise decisions. You and I need to make wise decisions. And this guy made choices. So he chose how to live and how to use his power and influence. You know, kings got a lot of power and influence. And you can do good and you can do bad. And he chose to use his power and influence for good. So what did he do? He built towns. He built cities. He built forts. I was quite amazed when I look at the account uh, of the kind of things that he built, you know. And he took over... <coughs> Where was the scripture? Huh? Yeah. He rebuilt the gate of the temple. The first thing he did was uh, to get the temple back in place. And maybe if we ever want to do something for God, the first thing we need to do is make sure our spiritual life is in place. And then he did extensive work on the wall. And then he built forts and towers in the wooded areas. And he, of course, kings in those days, you have to wage war. Either you fight or people come and attack you. Also still have to fight, you know. But he waged wars. And because of these things, tremendous amount of tribute was coming in. And because the tribute was coming in, the, com the country was prosperous, you know. So he used his position for the glory of God. And all of us actually have positions of influence, don't we? I was so happy when I came up here. The first thing I was happy about is that I heard Alan lead worship. Uh, because I haven't lead, heard him lead worship in a long time, you know. And he sings all the songs I know. So I was so happy with that. But I was also so happy, you know. I see so many new faces up there on the worship team. Uh, people I've never seen up there also, you know. Maybe I, I, I've seen you in the seat, but not up there. Huh? So I was so excited, you know, that there are people who are giving their talents and their gifts for God. You see, they may not be able to preach on the pulpit, but they are doing something that I will never be able to do. Let me tell you, I will never be able to beat those drums and sing. Wow, I tell you, those two ladies were singing fantastic voices, you know. But people tell me, your singing only God can appreciate. So I stuck to preaching. So you see, every one of us has gifts, you know. And then you have positions of influence. You know, there are some people you can talk to that I cannot talk to. There are some people you can talk to that pastors cannot talk to. You see, there are people who go to the coffee shop and sit down. Huh? Have you noticed that some people, they sit down in the coffee shop, suddenly four or five people sit around them and drink coffee with them. There are some people who can naturally connect with their neighbours. Everybody has some kinds of influence, some kinds of gifts, you know. And then there are people who are fantastic with accounts. Wow, very meticulous. They check every little account. We need everybody's gift. And this church goes on because everybody uses their gifts. Recently, I met one of my cell members who told, who told me, you know, at this season of my life, uh, I don't feel called to go out into the mission field, but I feel called to give to support the work on the mission field. Of course, five years from now, his life may change, you know, but I thought 
Hey, actually, a lot of people out there on the mission field need your money, you know. In fact, sometimes I tell myself, some of those people down there need my money more than they need me. Because I spent $2,000 to go down there, you spend five days. Of course, that doesn't mean you shouldn't send mission teams. Uh. But you know, some of these people, uh, their money can make so much of a difference uh, for somebody on the front line. So I realized the choices you make using the influence, using the powers, the gifts that you have, uh, can make such a difference if you make a choice. But you know what? The sad thing is, some people are also drifters. One of the things I enjoyed doing when I was a schoolboy, you know, I, I studied in the old RI, uh, where there's a canal behind the school, you know. And I would just sit down by the side of the canal, you know, and then just watch a piece of stick drifting. You ever done that or not? You watch this stick, doom, bob, 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 move down. Actually, it's very therapeutic, I tell you. Just watching this thing. Is, now these people pay money to buy arowana and watch the same thing happening. <laughs> but then, in those days, schoolboy, I watched this thing, very therapeutic, you know. But now I realize, you see, that a lot of people are there, a piece of stick, you know. They're just driven by the tide in the canal. The water flows, they flow. There's a drop, they drop. There's a rock, they hit, and then they move to the side. And a lot of people live through life like that. They don't make choices. Their life drifts. And I pray that we don't allow our lives to be like that. Then the third thing I want to say is consistency of the walk, <coughs> which Hebrews tells us. Huh? If we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. There is a promise at the end of it, but it requires us to be faithful to walk to the end. To be faithful to the end in all the ways that God brings to you, and it will be in many ways. Some people just want to be faithful in one or two things, huh? and they close their eye to a lot of things, you know. And it's those things that they close their eyes to that eventually begin to mess up their lives. The father had failed, people had failed, but he decided to be faithful, continue to walk with God. You can imagine he must have faced a lot of disappointments, you know. You break down idols. Then you find that people are still having idols in another place. And you can't break down all the idols in the country. Can you imagine the frustration he must have faced? And I tell you, I've met many, many Christians uh, who are sprinters, you know. Ellen, you're a sprinter, isn't it? Oh, Ellen was a sprinter. So they sprint, how many? 400 meters, 100 meters. 100, uh, 100 400 meters. But I've met a lot of sprinters who are fantastic sprinters, huh? But they cannot run 1,000 meters, 1,005, you know. Because they are built for different things. Nah. The guy can run very fast, you know, but cannot run far. It's important for us to run, but it is important for us to finish the race. So that's where the key comes for us, you know, to finish well. Are you and I going to continually, consistently run to finish well? Or do we want to run in spurts? Have you met Christians like that? They run in spurts, you know, on fire. Then they backslide. You don't see his face for a few weeks, few months. Then suddenly you come back, wow, full of fire. First one at the altar, hands highest raised, loud shouting hallelujah, all that, you know. And then after that, you don't hear hallelujah for some time. You know he's not around. Don't have to look behind. Sprinters. But no stamina to be long-distance runners. And... Frankly, at this age, I'm not a long-distance runner. I'm, I'm just a long-distance walker. <laughs> but I'm quite happy with it, you know. Yeah, to, to be able to walk half an hour. But then, you see, I'm finishing the distance. Because there are a lot of people who go down, the furthest they walk is to the Kopitiam to buy coffee and buy newspaper and go back. And there are a lot of people who are decaying in their homes because that's all the exercise they get in their life, you know. And so spiritually, uh, we need to be people who go for the long haul to tell ourselves, I am going to walk and I'm going to walk serving the Lord till the last day of my life. And this is what I, I've learned in life. Huh? It's not how you start, but how you end that counts. My friend used to tell me, uh, it's not how fast you go, you know, but how far you go 
that really will matter at the end. And you all know this guy on the right hand side, not the left one, huh? the one on the right, my old friend, huh? Pastor Patrick Lau, went to be with the Lord this year. He's one of those mentors. I think many of you would have known him. He spoke at our church camp. Huh? He's one of those guys I really respected because he's the longest serving general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. And he had such a difficult time. He came to the Lord, went into Bible school as a teenager with the objection of his parents, but he made a choice, I'm going to serve God. No turning back. And he carried on leadership, touched hundreds of lives. At his funeral, I saw so many people testifying about how their lives were transformed. So many pastors who testified that they came into ministry because of his influence. But you know, he retired as a pastor in his church, uh, under very painful circumstances, you know. Was very, very deeply hurt. And, uh, but we kept in touch because we were good friends. Uh. And then, one day I heard he started another church. He was almost 70, you know. And he started another church. A man deeply hurt after leading a church. But you see, he never stopped being a shepherd. He never stopped loving people. So he started a church for people who were hurt in their church. Very interesting character. And so you meet people in his church. And he used to invite me three, four times a year to go and preach in his church. And they started off quite a big group. And then with COVID and all that, they no longer could afford to rent a place. So they have a house church, like a cell group. They are, in fact, I think my cell group is slightly larger than their church. But, you know, I enjoyed going to his church whenever he invited me to preach. Because there were two things. One is that there was such a dynamic worship, you know. You really can sense the presence of God as they worship the Lord. But the other thing that I enjoyed was what his church meant. His church stood out speaking loudly uh, that here was a man uh, who was sold out for God and was willing to pastor and care for the flock until his last day. And so until the last breath, uh, he was still caring for people around him, you know, who visited him in hospital. He was still ministering to people. He was a pastor till the end. And this is the kind of a role model that I look up to, you know. That when the church no longer needs me, when <coughs> I'm too old to preach and uh, none of the leaders in RCC know me anymore, uh, I have to look for other things to do, you know. But uh, I don't think I want to be somebody who just sit down and think of, now it's time for me to do grandfathering. I don't think I would end up uh, just sitting down drinking coffee at a coffee shop. Although I enjoy doing that. But, you know, that's not something I want to enjoy doing in my last days, you know. I think I want to live my life to the end. Uh, finding something to do for God. And I'm sure that God has a plan for each of you just as he has a plan for me. You know? And in the next season of my life, he will have things for me to do that I may not need the present capabilities to do, but he will have something to do. But I would like to leave it to the end of my day. So in conclusion, I want to just say a few things. Nine verses. Huh? Nine verses and a name you and I barely remember. How many of you remember who is this guy, Jotham? Before, after reading the Bible, not a very easy name to pronounce or so. Huh? But you see, he honoured God and God honoured him. He tasted the favour of God because he honoured God. And so I want to encourage you, don't let anyone distract you from your dedication to the ways of God and the things of God. Don't let relationships, culture, society, age, health, don't let any of these things distract you from living well till your last day. What your hands find to do, do with all your heart. Don't be workaholics. Huh? Some people work with all their hands, workaholics also. But be diligent as opposed to being laid back because life is good. And be mindful of the uncertainty and frailty of life. Friends, you and I have only one life to live. Let no one or nothing 
hold you back from living for Jesus, living well to the end. Let's pray. Ah, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Father. God may be speaking many things to many of you, but there are some things the Lord has just spoken to me to, to speak about. First thing is indifference in life. And if you ever reach that stage of indifference, I want to encourage you to do something about it. I want to encourage you just to bow your heads and you just look up to the Lord as we prepare to close. And then the Lord says, you know, there are some people who have built colossus in their life. You know colossus? Those hardening of, on your fingers and your toes. And, and certain areas of your life have become hardened rather than being tender and sensitive to God. And if you have developed callousness in some areas, this is a time to say, Lord, 2025 and beyond, I want to live well for you with a tender heart. And, and there are some people with pressure, pressure from situation, pressure from people, pressure from circumstances or maybe even self-created pressures. God knows what you are struggling with. But God also knows how He can see you through if you reach out to Him rather than be overcome. And finally, God is speaking to some people also. Don't plod. Stand up and walk. There are some people who are just plodding along with life. But God is telling you, stand up and walk. So as I close in prayer, I just want to give you just these few moments to think. Is God speaking to you about your own spiritual life? Because you know His desire. He wants you to live well, live well to the end. And if it's your desire to do that, and if there are hindrances in your life, I want to ask you to just lay it before Jesus. And say, Lord, I can't do it. You do it. And as uh, all heads are bowed and eyes are closed, as I prepare to close my share of the sermon, I want to ask you, if there's something that you'd like God to touch in your life, you just do this simple thing. Just raise your hands and lower it. And as I close in prayer, I want to pray for you. After the service, if you like prayer, we will be here to pray with you. But for now, if you want to make the decision and say, God, yes, Lord, I'm hearing and I want to do something. I want to encourage you, just raise your hands and lower it. Just raise your hands and lower it. And I want to especially remember you in prayer. But I'm going to be closing in prayer. Yes, I see a hand. Anyone else? I'm going to just ask God to do something in your life specially. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for this church, Lord. Thank you for a church that has stood the test of time and is still standing, Lord. And Father, we want to pray, O Lord, that 2025 will bring a new season into this church, Lord. A breath of fresh air, Lord. A new season as you raise up people, as you lift up your people, Lord. To do greater things for you, Lord. To shine as lights for you. And I want to pray you enable Elder Ellen, Pastor John and all the other pastors and leaders, Lord, to come together in unity to lead this church. And for people, Lord, you are speaking to specifically about their life. I want to just pray, Lord. You do something wonderful in their lives, Lord. You touch their hearts, Lord. You give them strength. You give them grace. For those whose hearts, the fire is dying out. I want to pray you put fresh fire, Lord. You put fresh fuel. You put tenderness in hardened hearts. They will, they will just want to live for you until the last day. So we commit this to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.